started in just a few just a few minutes once everyone has had a chance to join. Hey, I think we have most of the folks in the room. Ilya, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Um, as a quick reminder, if you need closed captions, you can turn those on at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And we will be taking questions tonight through the Q&A feature. Uh, tonight, we are discussing how to support school boards, uh, exploring the history of the push towards privilization, and uh, we're also going to hear some firsthand stories of how students are advocating for their social communities. Um, our tech support tonight is our LWV main staff members, Allison and Jen, if you can reach out to them if you need anything or run into any problems. My name is Amelia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an internship, and I'm doing an internship with the League of Women Maine Voters, and I am in part of the Youth Council, and I will pass it to Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior at Madomic Valley High School, and I'm going to, throughout the meeting, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what school boards do, and my own experience working with my school board. And I will pass it to Alex. Hi, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm a Scarborough High School junior and a current volunteer for the Legal Moon Voters Maine. Uh, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about my experience with school board policy. Uh, and I'll pass it to uh, Kelly. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kelly Doe. I use she, her pronouns. I am here as a, a member of our leadership team for a main nonprofit called Sport Maine's Public Schools, where we are working to defend public education against uh, attacks that we're going to learn a little bit more about tonight. And I am going to pass this on to um, Steve Bailey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Bailey. I'm the executive director of the Maine School Boards Association and very pleased to be here tonight to both listen as well as participate. I will pass it on to... Let's see. Hmm. Mo Cunningham. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mo Cunningham. I'm a now retired professor of political science at UMass Boston and author of a book called Dark Money and the Politics of School Privatization. So I've been following the kind of groups that are attacking public education for quite some time now. And I'm not sure who I'm passing it to. Kelly? I think we are. We're back. Oh, Alice. Okay. Oh, Alice. Oh, Alice. Great. Um, as we heard, we are excited to be joined by Mo Cunningham, and who's the author of his recent book that dives deeper into our school board topic as well as we're thrilled to have Steve Bailey, the executive director of the Maine School Board Association. Um, would either of you like to add anything else to your introductions? Good, I'm, we're raring to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait. All right, uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we're going to dive in by learning about the background and history of public school privatization. Uh, Mo, can you give us an overview of your research? Sure. So I, I was asked um, to cover three things, the, the history of efforts to dismantle public schools, where's the money coming from and what can we do? So I'll, I'll take them in that order. Though so I look at sort of the modern uh, effort to privatize schools. It really goes back to uh, the 1954 uh, decision of the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education. 
following that decision of efforts to desegregate schools throughout the country uh, began to mount. Um, and there was um, uh, great resistance uh, in the South in particular, massive resistance, it was called. And these included efforts to privatize uh, schools, to not have public schools in town in certain cities any longer, um, to open desegregation academies. But shortly a thereafter, though, in 1955, an, an economist named Milton Friedman, later, later a Nobel Prize winning economist, um, uh, wrote about uh, vouchers, in essence, to, you know, what he was saying was we should have uh, uh, taxpayer money supporting education, but not public education. It should go uh, wherever people choose. It was really a, a very uh, clever uh, way to go about it. Um, it, it. In essence, although Friedman wasn't arguing for this, uh, it clearly would allow for continued uh, desegregate, uh, segregation uh, of classrooms. Um, but it was based not on race, but on, on market-oriented kind of issues. And so it's been an important writing ever since. Um, so vouchers are a big part of what uh, the push to privatization has been. Uh, although um, the Josh Cowan, a professor of education at Michigan State, has written that vouchers have some of the worst results in the history of education research. So there's nothing great about them. Um, now we're in the middle of a campaign focused on book bans, on um, on uh, disrespect for LGBTQ youth, on race, uh, the, the the unwillingness in some jurisdictions to accurately teach race. So your freedom as students to to have an accurate education, to understand history, and to have you yourselves respected to develop your imagination, to find out who you are, um, to read books, enjoy film, the arts, all at risk of being taken away from you. Um, a high school teacher um, in, a, in a, well, he, he won a Senate seat down in Virginia in a race that focused on book bans. And uh, I, I particularly like his statement. He said, as a, as a high school teacher, he said, I know the difference one book can make for a child. And um, that certainly is the case um, in, in finding your way. You know, um, you open many different books, you explore, you find characters who speak to you, who are like you. Um, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's at risk right now. And while we're talking school boards, don't forget our librarians who are also under uh, attack. Our librarians need our help as well. Um, so the effort really is to privatize public schools. Um, and I don't think anyone has explained this better than uh, a conservative group called the Council for National Policy, which wrote a memo to Donald Trump and his education secretary, Betsy DeVos, in, uh, in, in, in uh, 2017. And here's what it said. It said that, you know, we should be moving away from public schools essentially abolishing public schools in favor of, here's your quote, free market private schools, church schools, and home schools as the normative American practice. So that's what school choice is. You can pay a corporation, a for-profit school. You can go to a church school by which Council of National Policy means Christian nationalist school, or you can homeschool. Those are your choices. That's what choice means. Um, so uh, that's kind of where we are right now. It's it's extremely well funded campaign. Some of the most, some of the richest uh, uh, individuals in the country pull this. So when you see, for example, uh, a group like Moms for Liberty, Parents Defending Education, and so forth, uh, you know it sounds upbeat, right? Who doesn't like uh, parents? But well, sometimes we don't like them. But who doesn't like moms, right? Um, and yet what they really are is front groups for the policy positions of billionaires. Because you cannot have, you know, um, a, a billionaire like Charles Koch or Alice Walton, the Walmart heir, come out and say this is the way policy should be. Because people immediately recognize uh, or they question whether these folks have it have their best interests at heart. And in fact, research in political science shows that uh, uh, the very wealthy have far different 
policy preferences than the rest of us. The rest of us, for example, in this in this mode we're talking about tonight, want to support our public schools, uh, but many of the richest Americans do not. So um, this kind of thing, um, I'm going to be mentioning the Heritage Foundation a few times. They are one of the big think tanks, $100 million a year in, 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 in income they have to push things out. And they have been fighting this fight, you know, since the 70s. Um, again, a little a little history um, uh, about them. They, there was a, a, a conservatives challenging uh, school boards in West Virginia in the 70s. And uh, the Heritage Foundation, one of their writers said that conservative parents must stop trusting public education. Diminishing trust in public education is a big part of what they do. They try and create chaos to create distrust. So this writer said, you know, we, we have to we have to get people to stop trusting public education and they ha we have to attack and disrupt their school boards in any way we can. OK, so that this so this sort of thing goes back 50 years and heritage is still with us, by the way. So um, it's hard. To, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, tracking money. It's hard to do. You know, these people, uh, you have very, very wealthy people who hire very, very smart people to hide money from the rest of us. All right. Um, so take Moms for Liberty. It's very hard to figure out who's funding Moms for Liberty because of the legal forms they take. But I it, I know one funder is a guy named uh, Richard Uline. He's a billionaire from Wisconsin, funds, um, you know, anti-abortion things, uh, uh, has big money involved uh, in, in funding uh, Moms for Liberty. Um, another group is a woman named Julie Fancelli. She's from Florida, where Moms for Liberty originated. She is the an heiress of the public's supermarket fortune. She funds Moms for Liberty. She's also funded over $3 million she put into the January 6th Stop the Steal rally. So we see over and over and over again these groups, the Walton Family Foundation, Uline, um, Jeffrey Yass, the richest man in Pennsylvania, uh, billionaire, funds these kinds of things as well. So the funding sources are really, I mean, it's almost a, a handful of people I could fit in my kitchen, you know, and I have a really small kitchen. So um, it's the same people over and over and over again. Um, but they do not wish... Uh, um, for one, they're very motivated ideologically by market-oriented systems. They're very oriented by the fact, uh, this is a huge orientation for them, they don't want to have to pay taxes, particularly for your education. You know, they don't. Um, and so this plays a major role uh, in, in, in the way they approach things, okay? Um, so a little bit about the kind of things uh, we can do to stand up for our schools, stand up for our school boards, stand up for our librarians. All of them need your voices. So um, I'm no longer quite as young as you students there. I'm really excited to talk to you, by the way. You're, you're the real, this is the most excited I get to talk all year long because I'm talking to you because you, you are real. your voices matter so much. You may not know how much they matter, but your voices really carry a great deal of weight. When I was young, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, the, the elder, not, not the son, Robert F. Kennedy went to Cape Town, South Africa uh, to give a speech and the South African government, which was a, apartheid at the time, did not want him to speak, but he went anyway. And he said this, and I apologize, it's gendered language, but it's 1966. Bobby Kennedy said this, each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples builds a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So each one of us can create a tiny ripple of hope. And those all join together. We have to act together. First, understand you're in the majority. The American public wants to support its public schools. They want to support its school boards, its librarians, its teachers, its administrators and superintendents. Make sure your voice is heard. This is your education, your future, your right 
to learn the true history. Your right, if you're LGBTQ, to be treated with respect. Your right to have your friends and fellow students treated with respect. All right? That is your right. Do not let them take it away from you. Don't let bigoted people take those rights and freedoms away from you. School board, if you have school board races, learn about the candidates, work for the ones who support you getting a good education, the education you deserve and you have a right to. Go to meetings, offer support and testimony. Heck, thank a school board member. Why not? They work hard for no pay and these days a fair amount of aggravation. Work with your, and seek out teachers, paraprofessionals, superintendents, administrators, parents, custodians. In this fight, you are all together. Whatever differences you may have in this fight, you are all together. Find common ground, particularly with the custodians. My mother was a custodian, so it's very important to be nice to custodians. <laughs> organize, organize, organize. Get together with your friends, get together with the teachers, the paraprofessionals, the board members, all the administrators, the parents, and of course, the custodians. Work together because it's all those tiny ripples of hope that build the current which can sweep down the walls of oppression and resistance. And in this case, protect what we have that is a gem for us, and that is public education. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for, for sharing this with us and with the work that you do. Um, we do have a couple minutes here to for folks to drop questions into the Q and A. And I know uh, some of our youth speakers who are who are on the call tonight. If either of you have any questions for Mo that have come up while he was speaking, feel free to take yourself off mute and ask a question while I pull up the Q and A. Uh, I'm wondering if you know any connections between Moms for Liberty and general fight against uh, public education and the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, I believe. Uh, I know one of my friends is like obsessed with that and he's been talking about how connected that is to like uh, defunding public education. So I want to hear more about that. I need to be in touch with your friend. Yes, he's exactly right. The Homeschool Legal Defense Association um, which at one time was led by the same guy who led an operation called the Alliance Defending Freedom. They're all kind of, they're all in a network. This, I mentioned this Council for National Policy earlier. Um, you know, Heritage is, is within it. Uh, um, ADF is within it. The Homeschool Legal Defense Fund is, is within it. These are, um, and uh, you know, the, they, they support some of the worst, uh, most bigoted programs you can imagine. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom, by the way, boasts, and they're, you know, they're right to boast about it. I don't know how you feel, anybody in here feels about uh, the right to choose, but the Alliance uh, Defending Freedom is, is brags, and they're right to brag because they did, they brought down Dobbs. They were, one, they were the ones behind the Supreme Court decision, the case that became Dobbs, okay? So, uh, yeah, and Moms for Liberty is clearly part of this. This is clearly um, not only money, but it is Christian nationalist backing. Homeschool Legal Defense Association is Christian nationalist. ADF is Christian nationalist. Uh, Moms for Liberty is. Heritage Foundation is, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, your friend is really on the right track. Um, um, they, I'm glad that this is really thrilling for me to hear that that you, that you, you folks are, are are really on this because you really have the most important voices. I am not exaggerating at all. Get out there and make your voice heard. Thank you, Alex, for for, for that question. Um, we have a a question here in the the chat um, from Michael of. It's a question, it's a two-part question here of when schools are privatized, how are they proposed to be paid for? Like where is the funding for the privatization coming for once they're established? And if students don't have money to go to that private school, is there a system in place? Do you have you heard any rumblings of what happens to the students who can't go to these private schools? Well, the idea behind vouchers is that each each uh, for each uh, student um, accept, uh, applying for the voucher, the parent guardians will will receive a sum of money that will allow them to go to a, to another school. Okay, so they can go out and seek their own school, right? 
but it's usually going to be something that is several thousand dollars. You are not going to go to, I'm from Massachusetts originally, so I'm just going to give you Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols, the Choate School, or whatever. You are not going to go to one of those schools on $8,000. Instead, you are going to be able to go to schools that are often quite subpar, that escape state regulation, that are uh, many uh, religious. I mean, one of the things my friend Josh Cowan, uh, education researcher, has been finding is that as as vouchers proliferate, the money is really going 75% to, to, to students who are already uh, in private school. So it's simply going to subsidize people who could already afford to go to private school. But it does very, does very little for uh, students uh, who are trying to move from, from public uh, to private. In fact, and it, 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 you know, Josh has also found a lot of these schools are religious in nature. A lot of them were financially failing, and so they're looking for the, to these vouchers as a bailout. And in some some of the some states, uh, conservatives are even encouraging schools open open a school. I mean, religious organizations open a school because the money is coming. So um, so that is a huge crisis with vouchers. Um, why would a co private company want to open a private a charter school? I mean, there's many, many reasons. Many people are have a very sincere interest um, in, in in providing a good education for children. Um, um, that's the case. Uh, there are private schools that are for profit. For profits, for profit schools exist for any business that that seeks a profit. They're trying to maximize profits. Um, and so, um, you know, there are certainly very fine charter schools. Uh, there are very fine public schools, but you really, um, you know, now you're in a market, so shop carefully, right? And you can see in this area advertising that is trying to lure you in because they want your dollars, right? So um, it's really, uh, it, it is really uh, a situation that I think it does not favor uh, students and families at all. Thank you well, so much for, for sharing your research with us. And we really appreciate you bringing the, the wide lens and the history of this work into tonight's conversation. Um, and we're gonna have another opportunity for Q&A after we narrow down a little bit both to what happens with main school boards and what some of our students' experiences have been. So Mo, well, you're welcome to stick around with us and help answer questions at that Q&A as well. Um, at this moment, I'm going to go back to sharing screen and Anna, you are our next speaker. Yeah, absolutely. So while this slide is being pulled up, I'm going to just be going over a little bit about what it is that school boards do and what they don't do. Um, so some of the responsibilities. I'm sorry. So we're moving on to the next section here. Um, some of the things that school boards do, they they make the rules for the entire district. They're in charge of making policies, but they don't carry out the policies. That's the responsibility of the superintendent. And this is really important when it comes to things like um, using the law, for example, as a guideline for how they're forming their rules and then writing these policies that teachers and other staff members are able to apply to their districts. They're also in charge of hiring and evaluating the superintendent, but that is the only staff member that they have um, that they have some sort of say in in terms of hiring them. The other staff, the other staff members are not the responsibility of the school board. They set the they set sort of a goal for the tra trajectory of their district and just overall looking at the big picture. So they are responsible for making decisions. And like I said, writing policies that will, that will, that they believe will further the trajectory of the school and benefit the district in the long run. And they are also in charge of handling things like facilities. They create the budget for the district and they must adhere to state law, as I previously mentioned. They handle insurance and employee benefits and they are in charge of adopting a course of study, which as we've seen can get um, somewhat controversial at times and just deciding what it is that students will be focusing on and what may be most important for students to be learning about. 
and they handle the expulsion due process and reentry and approve emergency management planning. School boards are also they're also required to hold all meetings publicly, which means that anyone can come and attend the meetings. It is um, more common that that larger groups of people will come to speak on certain issues or present something to the school board before a decision is made at various meetings. And they must include a public comment period where audience members are able to say something to the board and try to get a point across. They're in charge of adopting policies that handle things like which library books are available in the school libraries and what materials students are using to learn. So this is one of the areas that can be difficult for the school board to find a common ground on, ground on at times, um, as we've seen, especially in recent years with things like book banning happening in many public schools across the United States and in Maine. They're also responsible for adopting the school calendar and figuring out when the school is going to open and close. So this could be just deciding whether or not the school opens before or after Labor Day and when the breaks are in the school year. And they work with school with the school and district leaders to figure out what the schedule of the school is, what supplies are provided, how they can keep the school and the students and teachers safe, discipline, things like that. Um, essentially just all of the various things that will help the, the district progress and make sure that schools are running smoothly. There are also a few things that school boards do not do that are um, important to note. School boards don't enforce the policies that they write. They are only responsible for writing them. The superintendent is in charge of enforcing the policies, but boards should still be follow following the policies that they write. And they don't hire or evaluate any staff members other than the superintendent. I'm now going to pass it over to Steve, who's going to give us a little bit more information on um, the school board makeup and budget process. Thank you, Anna. I should bring you along to uh, some of our uh, board development board training workshops. <laughs> um, in this particular slide, uh, we do talk about the geographic uh, makeup of the uh, the board. Uh, it, it really does depend on the geographic area. Uh, individuals are chosen from a town water district, and anyone can run for school board if you're 18 and a resident. Uh, if there are vacancies, those typically are, are uh, determined by um, elected officials. Uh, if there's a vacancy, then that can be filled in a particular way as de determined by statute based on the makeup of the of the uh, school board and the kind of uh, uh, school board that it is. Um, a big factor to remember is that school board members have no power individually, but only when acting as a whole board together at a public posted meeting. And in the statute, um, those uh, powers and responsibilities are given to the full board. They're not given to individuals, but really only as, as the full board. Um, Steve, is there anything that Anna covered while I pull up our timeline slides that you would like to expand upon? I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, in terms of one thing, uh, the budget creation typically, and, and uh, I think we may be talking about this a little bit later on, but uh, school boards in terms of budget creation, typically the uh, superintendent working with administrators would uh, come together and be able to identify what the needs of of the school district might be, and then they would bring it to the board uh, for their determination as to uh, what might need to be adjusted or what might need to be uh, in increased or, or cut. Uh, and then it becomes uh, theirs to really talk about and really um, determine what's going to be in the best interest of the district, what's going to be in the best interest of students to be able to provide for uh, meeting the strategic plan that they may have uh, going forward. So uh, in terms of this this flow, uh, and, and is this uh, something you wanted me to go through, uh, Allison? Yeah, so we'd love for you to share your okay. expertise here. All right. So, so typically, um, that budget process does start in late fall. Um, and for municipalities or for SADs or RSUs, that budget process would, would begin in October, November, December. They start talking about the needs for the next year. 
often they're not talking about, okay, building a budget based on what they've already spent, but really looking at uh, what's going to be uh, in the best interest of our students and what, what do we need for programs to be able to support our students. So that happens, and the superintendent crafts that to be able to develop that draft to be able to send um, in early winter uh, to the school board. And so we can move on to the next slide and, and really show us uh, that January, April time, uh, school board uh, takes a look at uh, budget to budget increases, uh, what the impact to taxpayers might be, uh, how much uh, each town might have to pay in taxes, because that's one of the things that not only do you have to be responsible for what's in the best interest of students within the district, but what impact is it going to have on the town? And you have to kind of walk that fine line of balancing uh, student needs and programs that you want to see happening with what the taxpayers actually can support. And that's a really important communication that wants to happen between superintendent and the board and town officials and, and members of the community to make sure you, you maintain that fit and that balance uh, as you continue to make progress toward what you want to see happen within your, within your uh, school department. So as that happens uh, in April, the school board reviews the budget, they ask questions, they try to make adjustments. Um, uh, typically in May, uh, there is a, a district budget meeting where the public's invited to ask questions and vote on each individual cost center, which then gets uh, aggregated up to an overall budget uh, that would be developed and be able to be determined, is this the best budget that we can put forward uh, to the voters and have them approve uh, for this, this next uh, school year? Thanks for sharing that all oh, that in-depth process into our budget process. I know we have one more slide here where we want to dive into the, the details of some of what we're seeing in Maine and have you speak a little bit to as your position lets you get the insights into what are our school boards experiencing. Sure. And in this particular slide, it is interesting as we hear from boards across the state. And um, and what I would, would say is we, we call it book banning, but uh, actually it's it's also what we call in terms of our policy, it's, it's a challenge uh, to instructional or library materials that might be within the school. And I would say that there have been one, one successful challenge, and that was up in RSU uh, 56 up in the Peru area where uh, I think the book Gender Queer was, was voted uh, to be removed from uh, the school and from the library. There have been many other uh, challenges, but uh, unsuccessful ones, um, and, and I, I say thankfully so, and they, they were able to follow the process that was put in place uh, to be able to uh, make sure that folks understood what the uh, instructional integrity was of why the book was in the schools, and uh, they, they've been able to maintain those those books for a variety of reasons and for a variety of students within those those schools. Um, related to the uh, gen gender expansive, uh, transgender uh, expand and gender expansive policy, uh, ACAAA, um, as the slide says, uh, 70 districts have adopted, uh, some have tried, and have decided not to go quite that far and instead have uh, stayed with the procedure that is that is still uh, uh, effective to be able to support law but policy when is when it is supported by the board it provides some strength of support for both the students as well as uh, staff within within the district to to feel as if they've got the, both the school board as well as policy as well as the law on their side to be able to both live their lives as, as well as, as Mo indicated before, to be able to uh, both uh, identify and be able to live their lives. Um, 117 districts so far don't have policies. Um, and I have seen, matter of fact, one is uh, uh, I think on a vote uh, this Thursday night, uh, they're having a second reading to decide whether or not they're going to be uh, taking that uh, policy and, and uh, deleting it as, as one of the adopted policies. I think that's our issue 40 up in the Walderboro area. So um, it, it is a kind of a volatile uh, type of a scene we're seeing right now. Um, 
And part of that is uh, because of who's being elected to school boards. And uh, Mo's uh, comment before of, of uh, making sure that people, you know, stay active and stay involved, uh, get to know the candidates, as well as to be able to promote and support us uh, candidates that are going to be supportive of, of what you want to see happening within our schools. Thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise with this group, and we'd love for you to stick around for the, the Q&A portion. Um, we're going to switch gears here to share some of the students' experiences that are on this call, and then we will move on to another question and answer period. So please be dropping your questions into the Q&A, and we'll be we, the ones that we can answer through typing, we will do so as we go. So I'm going to start in by talking a little bit about my personal experience with this with my school board and my district. I'm actually in RSU 40. So um, the the ACAAA policy that is being challenged right now is definitely a very current issue for me. Um, I am attending that meeting on Thursday. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that and also things that have happened in the past. So starting with book banning, that was a significant topic in uh, 2022 in my district and the books being challenged were gender queer and lawn boy um, both of which have lgbtq themes and eventually the it was determined that the books would be able to stay in our libraries uh, but interestingly enough what we've found is that because when a book is challenged it has to be taken out of the library until the issue is resolved Part of the strategy for people who are trying to keep books out of our libraries is to continually challenge certain books so that they have to be out of our libraries even once they've been decided on um, because the more you challenge them, the more they have to take them out while, as they go through the process of determining if they can be in our school libraries. So I've definitely seen a little bit of that happening, um, but the current, as I said, the shift in focus has been on the ACAAA policy, which is essentially a policy that was put in place that was based on interpreting a law that is meant to protect the rights of trans students and make sure that they have a safe and comfortable learning environment. That is sort of the purpose that is outlined on the front of the policy in our district. And there have been a lot of things that I've been trying to do with friends of mine in and other peers in my school in um, the month of May and June to just kind of do as much as we can to show our support for this policy. So I have worked with friends and just classmates of mine to mobilize as many people as we can and just encourage people to come to the meetings and show their support and speak if they're willing to and just encouraging them to go out and vote on June 11th, which is the, um, the time of the next election for the school board. And we have also spread a petition around that is just that was just us trying to show how many students in our school alone just in my high school were in support of the ACAAA policy. I have spoken directly to the board which I did at the last meeting where this policy was addressed and I plan to do again this Thursday um, just expressing what it is I why why I am support in support of this policy and why it would be harmful to remove it. Um, how that works at, in my district is we just have three minutes to speak and typically for more controversial meetings like the this policy or with meetings where they're discussing book banning, they'll extend the audience comment period so that more people are able to speak. And I am also part of a student group called Education Matters, and it is a group of graduates or seniors in my school who have tried to endorse new candidates for our school board because we're concerned about the direction that the school board may be headed in. And we've done work in the past few weeks to make pamphlets and canvas and just encourage people to go out and vote. And also we have um, had a press release where we're specifying why we support the candidates that we support in our in our towns and what it is they stand for. And we've done some meetings with these candidates and um, had conversations with them online. So those are just some ways that I've been involved. And it's it's honestly, the work isn't 
you know, it's it's as much or as little as you want to make it. If if it's something that is meaningful to you, it is not too difficult to shoot an email to a school board member or to go and speak at a meeting. Um, and it can be very impactful. And actually, this picture in the background on this slide is from the last school board meeting, which was on May 16th, where the ACAAA policy was addressed. And you can only see half of the bleachers. There is another set of bleachers not in the picture where there were more people. And this was a significant turnout for um, mostly for people in support of the policy. And um, there it is expected that there will be more people at the next meeting. So just honestly showing showing up to these meetings and like I said, just being being there to show that you are in support of something can make a significant difference. So that's that's my piece. I'm gonna pass it over to Alex. Thank you all for listening. Uh, hi, so I don't actually know what RSU Scarborough is, but uh, I am from Scarborough. Uh, similarly, we also had a transgender student policy issue. This was actually last year, and rather than a sort of book banning policy, we actually had a policy involved in the rights of transgender students and like pronoun usage in and out of the classroom. Uh, Scarborough is actually, I guess, decent at this sort of fact in that we have a book committee that approves us uh, sort of educational materials that's not related to sort of like book banning policies. Um, and we have a lot of transgender books, luckily, because of the general makeup of our school board. Um, we haven't really had to worry about those sort of banning policies. And last year, we actually had to deal with not introducing a transgender student policy, but rather amending one. Um, the year before last year, we had implemented a transgender student policy with the help of My Civil Rights Club. And that was meant to sort of help um, the outing of closeted transgender students who use the classroom in the school place as a sort of safe haven, as an environment to experiment with their gender and their pronouns and uh, their gender expression. Um, before this, there was requirements to not protect students. Um, and the introduction of the initial transgender student policy was meant to make sure that teachers knew that they didn't have to tell um, sort of, I guess, other people about in-classroom pronoun usage. Of course, that's uh, not limited under FERPA, uh, which requires for all uh, academic records and emails that if a parent re uh, requests that information that that be given to the parents. This was more so for in-classroom dialogues rather than um, sort of documented papers. But a lot of the policy had like may or might in the subjunctive and that led a lot of teachers sort of confused about what they should be doing because it allowed for them to not be using these pronouns but it didn't definitively tell teachers what to do. So a lot of what my work with my civil rights club was actually going to those work sessions and showing up early rather than showing or just showing up to a vote later on so we could affect that bill or sorry that policy language earlier in the process because we were so much as interested in uh, voting yes no for the policy. We were interested in making sure the language was furthered to protect our transgender students. So a lot of that was working, uh, spreading further knowledge throughout the school community for allies that we could find, attending all the school board work sessions and holding public comment there, because as said before uh, by Anna, uh, all of those are publicly required, um, sorry, required to be public. So we actually spoke for those on what we wanted the policy uh, language and how we wanted it to change. And by involving ourselves earlier in that sort of process, uh, we could actually affect the policy and what it did even further because we already had a good uh, demographic makeup in our school board. Thank you, Alex. Um, I really appreciate you and um, Anna taking a second to, to share your experiences. And we had one other student who 
couldn't join us tonight, but still wanted to make sure her experience was shared. And so she has given me a, few, a little a script to read to you all really quickly. This student is um, a student representative on a school board. And um, she is actually at a school board meeting tonight. So she could not <laughs> join us because she is fulfilling her role as the student representative. Um, so she says, I'm so excited to share with you all my experience of being a student representative for Portland High School. She, I apologize I can't be there tonight in person, but I, she's still very happy to share some of her key points from being a board member. I started my term as a student representative last December with an official inauguration, inauguration during a board meeting. In January, we started jumping off directly into the budget where we were facing a $10 million deficit in funds. There were many public forums and log meetings to discuss how to approach a challenge like this. As a 16 year old, listening to the financial information can be complicated and confusing. Fortunately, the superintendent of Portland Public Schools and the chair of the school board are extremely welcoming to any and all questions that I've had. They clearly explain things and I that I don't under, they clearly explain things so that I don't need further clarification and allow all of the board members to make an effort to talk with me about my experiences and if I need further explanation or helping understand anything. Questions and comments from the student representatives tend to be addressed before those of any other board member, which makes me feel that my opinion is especially important and that they care about the student experience. The Portland Public School Board has several student representatives, myself for Portland High School, another for Deering High School, Casco Bay High School, Portland Arts and Technology High School, and the Portland Education Adult Education Center. It's incredibly valuable to have student representatives from each one of these schools to provide a bigger picture of how this school system is functioning. During nearly every public comment section or public forum, people from the community express how they feel appreciated to how they appreciate seeing students and looking back at them as they advocate for their own education. Having student representatives allows for a lot of people to have more trust in school boards when we are the ones who are able to directly impact decisions. And we just, so I really appreciate Charlotte sharing those words with us and wanted to make sure that her, her thoughts were also included. We're gonna move on to a few actions that you all can take if you have found this discussion particularly interesting or engaging tonight. Uh, so, uh, the league has some programs nationally, but specifically locally for Maine that can allow you to sort of help in this school board uh, education process. For one, uh, we have a sharing election information sort of, uh, I don't know what to call it. I guess like part of our website, um, it's called uh, Vote 411, I believe. Uh, and under that, if you find that your town under that database isn't actually being covered, you can do this thing called adopt a town where you actually put in your inform or put in the information for your town under the database so more, more people can access that sort of information in the future. So by doing that sort of process, you can help everybody access that information more equitably. And of course, just sharing the website information in and of itself. Um, if people don't know, like, this sort of information, this can be a great way of explaining this without having to like look up all the details about what districts are located in. And they just put in their address, uh, their city, their zip code. And from there, they can find all of this election information. And it's really great. It's really accessible and it's really easy to use. So definitely use this database if you haven't tried it and you don't know about your sort of voter information. Uh, and I'll pass it off to Kelly to talk a little bit more about her work. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, and everybody, the, um, these presenters, thank you, amazing. Um, so part of Support Maine's public schools and our efforts is a lot of what Alex just talked about, um, and actually all of the panelists have mentioned, and that's about making sure that people are aware of what the issues are uh, in their own towns, knowing what 
SAU you're a part of, um, if you are an SAU or what school district uh, you are in. You as a citizen are invited and welcome and allowed to attend any school board meeting um, that you would like. And so the first thing we would recommend for people is to get informed. Um, if you're, find out what's going on in your town, find out what's going on on your school board. A lot of these meetings um, are recorded. Uh, so for step one, we would say, check the websites for your, well, check that database that Alex mentioned, but also check that, the websites for your school districts and find out uh, when their meetings are, find out who their school board members are and what you can find out. Some of them are elected by a region or a zone or a town. Others might be uh, a full community. And so understanding who's representing you uh, and your school district. Um, also, if they have meetings online, watch them. Um, you can understand the tenor and uh, flow of a school board meeting just by watching those videos if they are available. Um, and if you can't find one for your district, sometimes even peeking at the district next door to see if they have a video might help you to get a little more comfortable with what that process looks like. Um, if you have a, um, an interest in uh, as we uh, mentioned, the book banning or the challenges. Find out what books are being challenged. Um, you could do the cheat sheet um, that some folks have been using to challenge books uh, and look at a list called Book Looks. Or you could just uh, check out what's going on in your school district. I would encourage you to pick up that book and read it so that you can have those conversations and know what the conversations are about um, and maybe have your own perspective. Um, Additionally, uh, we would say that we want you to not just get informed, but also um, get a network and get some training. We have a couple of organizations that we work with. Um, one is called Heal Together. It's a national group, and they actually have a um, one-hour training that will be next Tuesday. Um, and I believe some of our tech geniuses behind us will uh, put that in the chat for you all. I encourage you to check it out uh, and register for that. It, it really explains to you uh, and to, to people nationwide what our roles and responsibilities are in a democracy. And um, if we have an interest in defending public education, which we know is a cornerstone of said democracy, um, how we can go about doing that. That other piece is about making those connections with others who are um, coming to the same understandings or want to have those same conversations. So that's where we would encourage you to connect with us. Support Maine's Public Schools um, is connecting people community by community to talk to one another. We're also connecting people across the state of Maine with others in other communities to learn about best practices and ways in which you can help uh, to be a part of the conversation, whether it's getting, um, uh, you know, talking with candidates and uh, ensuring that people are electing those who have the best interests of our all students onto the boards, or whether or not it's going to be, um, you know, you're speaking up on certain topics and issues like we've heard our students um, doing tonight. So we would encourage you to connect with us there. And I would say that um, lastly, we would say, get involved. Um, it's sometimes um, the getting involved, the easiest and the best way to do it is do it with kindness. Um, right now, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of rhetoric. Um, there is a lot um, that there is a reliance on misinformation and misrepresentation on what's actually happening in our schools. But we know when people hear, when people ask community members, tell me about your school, tell me about your, your teachers. Often what we hear is, oh, but I love my school. I love my student, you know, my, um, my, my teacher. We want those stories out there because right now there is, you know, um, uh, Mo explained about how we're really trying to malign, there's an effort to malign public education and for people to create a mistrust. What we know is that we overwhelmingly have support of the, the population of our public schools. We need to tell the good stories. So our students sending that message that Mo, that Mo talked about or you know, to that teacher standing up at the school board meetings and sending your thanks, those are all things that we would say. Um, and letting your school board members know that we appreciate them as well because we want those um, who are really doing the good work 
to stay. And right now it's a really tough job and not everyone wants to do it. Thank you, Kelly, for, for wrapping out our wrapping up our actions there. We are going to move into kind of our final question and answer period here with our last three minutes of your, your time this evening. And as we're pulling up these questions, please everybody remember that next Tuesday is an election day. You will be, many towns will be voting for their school board members. So turn out to vote on next Tuesday, um, July 11th. So we have a couple questions here. Um, Tanya is asking, and I can open this up to any of our panelists. I think folks, we have some folks that have really worked closely with school boards, but she's commenting on, there's been a, as we've heard here, there's been a lot of harassments and threats at school boards. And how do we restore civility at meetings and forums to encourage good candidates to stay in their positions and to run again and to stay engaged? So are there any tips that any of our speakers have for keeping that, that tone and that welcoming environment to our school board meetings? Take it away, Steve. <laughs> um, I would I would just add that uh, a a good strong chair makes a a big big difference in terms of making sure they understand uh, both policy as well as the operational structure of the meetings, as well as to have that be a goal of the board itself. Uh, because if you want to have a a respectful, dignified meeting, uh, number one, you you identify that and set the tone and model it yourself as the board as well as uh, demonstrate that through what the expectations are for public comment period, have strong uh, introductions as to what is okay uh, by establishing norms and guidelines for the meetings and then stick to them so that uh, people know that this is your, your normal means of, of practice and routine. Thanks, Steve. And Mo, do you have something yeah. to add there? I saw you came off. I, I, I was gonna say, I think that's great advice. Uh, um, I, I would add, again, uh, show up and bring your friends. Um, uh, on some level, it's numbers, you know, you have more people there. Um, as Kelly says, uh, behave respectfully, behave decently, behave kindly, uh, but do speak up. And I can tell you that there is a backlash against these disruptors. People do not like folks coming into their community meetings and causing enormous disruption. It is, it is, it is, uh, a pronounced backlash against moms for liberty. So uh, know you're on the right side, show up and stand up for the school board members and the superintendents. It's very, very important you do so. Thank you. And our, our last question that we have time for this evening comes from Lane. And Lane is asking if anyone in this webinar can speak a little bit more about the particular extremist groups that are active in Maine who are targeting public schools. For example, they've seen some posts from Maine First Project about RSU 40 and the school board vote on Thursday. Can anyone in this group speak to more of those? What we're seeing here in uh, I can certainly um, speak a bit. I think um, we have seen um, specific groups. Main First is one that was mentioned. Uh, there are others, whether that's at a very small local level. Uh, there have also been um, some groups that have been offering. Uh, training and uh, so, but it's done in, in something that feels a bit subversive where uh, people can go on a Saturday if they give an email and a deposit um, and they'll be shared the secret location for said training um, once they've been approved uh, so that they are then trained on how to attack um, both on the uh, school board meeting level, but also on, quite frankly, on a personal level um, at where they are attacking uh, the integrity um, and and sometimes personal uh, information about our school board members. Uh, Main First is one. I, um, I would say if that's something you have a question about uh, to reach out, I certainly don't want to give uh, their organizations any more airtime than I think they deserve. And I think I've given them more than that. Thank you, Kelly. Um, well, we are 
one minute over. So I'm gonna say a big thank you to all of our panelists and speakers who've come and shared their expertise and their experiences. And thank you all, more than 55 of you in our audience who've shown up today to listen to this conversation and learn a bit more. And please do send us any feedback if there's any particular topics we didn't cover tonight that you want us to expand on. We see this as only the start of our work in supporting local governments and our, our school systems. So thank you everyone and have a good evening. Bye-bye, thank you all.